Hi Vichu, welcome to this session uh, which is on FMG Jan 2024 recall OBGY questions. Now I know the exam is over, initially you people were having anxiety related to your exam, that exam dena hai, exam dena hai. And then now as the days are passing by, you are having anxiety related to result. That is normal, that's absolutely normal but during this time, take a pause, breathe and enjoy the moment. You know, whatever is going to happen, we'll deal with it. I mean, I just pray that all of you get a very good result. But just in case the result is not what you expect, we'll deal with that. Don't worry. In the meanwhile, just manifest positive thoughts. Believe in yourself because as they say, the strongest factor for success is self-esteem. Believing you can do it, believing you deserve it and believing you will get it. So manifest positive things and then whatever the result comes, we are all there to deal with it, right? Now, uh, let me talk about a little bit about how the exam was and how the OBGY questions were. Now, after the exam were, was over, many of you had written to me that ma'am, OBGY, we found it easy and we were able to answer at least 80% questions. If you ask me that if in OBGY you are able to answer 80% questions, you have done really very well. See, what has happened in OBGY is that you people are, you were well prepared in OBGY. Now, whatever has happened in OBGY has happened in the other subjects too. If I talk about questions in OBGY, were there PYQs? No, they were not PYQs. But were there questions from important previous year topics? Yes. There were questions from PIH, there were questions from cancer cervix, there were questions from MTP, there were questions from Turner's syndrome and that, uh, I mean that is what we expect now, diabetes. These are the topics which we always tell to focus upon and so the questions were definitely from those topics from where they were expected to come. But if you say that per se was the question same? No, it was not the same. And that is why all throughout the year, I have been telling you that please don't mug up the previous year questions. The intelligent approach would be to revise the previous year important topics, right? Now, let us go one by one and see all the questions. I am pretty sure that by now you know the correct answers of all the questions. And that is why this particular recall video I am making so that, you know, either your junior or God forbid, I'm just God forbid, you have to come and look at it again. Then you don't have to run here and there for information related to that particular question. So I'm not going to just cover up the correct answer in this session. I am going to tell you some important points related to that particular topic. Although I am going to tell that in brief, but I'm going to show you that particular topic so that next time, God forbid, if you come to this particular video, then you have that entire topic. Now, not only this, you know, this particular video or these questions are not just important for students who will be appearing for the December FMG exam, but it is also important for the students who are going to give their NEET 2024. The questions were very good questions, I would say, and yes, they were slightly twisted. But on an average, the question range or was between simple to moderate, and the number of questions definitely was what it has always been. That has been somewhere around 30, 32 questions. And that is what we had this time also in OBGY, 30 to 32 questions which came in FMGE. Now, uh, since I am a faculty of MARO, so I'm also going to show you the places where the, these particular topics were covered in MARO. And since I am also the author of One Touch, so, in particular, today's session, I am going to show you where in one touch was that particular answer given. See, in one touch, which is hardly a 250 pages book, you will get maximum answers to maximum questions which were asked in this year FMGE, right? 
Now, just because I didn't have that much of time, so I have not noted down the page number, but you can see from the screenshot that it is a screenshot of one touch. So let's get going. First question which came was, a married lady presents with contraception failure at 22 weeks of gestation. True statement based on the MTP Act. But so on MTP Act, there were three questions which were asked this time, right? So over here, the striking point which they have asked and which we've all, always, always focused in class is that the MTP amendment which came in 2021, it says that MTP can be done up till 24 weeks, but, but if it, the pregnancy is due to contraceptive failure, then according to the amendment also, it is still done at 20 weeks. Even after the amendment, if the pregnancy is due to contraceptive failure, then also the MTP can be done only till 20 weeks. Same thing I have covered over here also. In on page 33 of One Touch, I have made you write that MTP can be done till 24 weeks. In case of contraceptive failure, MTP can be done only up till 20 weeks. So over here, they are saying a female who has had contraceptive failure, she's come to you at 22 weeks. True statement is. Now, although definitely I agree that two doctors opinion would be needed if I would have been doing MTP between 20 to 24 weeks. But in this case, I cannot do an MTP at 22 weeks, right? Because this, M this pregnancy is as a result of contraceptive failure. That is why option A and option B are wrong. Now, medical board's permission is required for termination. That is also incorrect, Vita, because medical board's permission is required in case of severe congenital anomalies of the fetus. If there is a severe congenital anomaly of the fetus, then there is no upper limit for doing MTP. And then you need medical board's permission, right? So again, option C over here is incorrect. This female has no other option than continuing pregnancy. That is all what I'm going to tell her that MTP cannot be done in your case. So for question number one, correct answer is option D. Now, coming to next question, which was again on MTP. Mentally challenged girl presents for MTP. Next step according to MTP Act and they have asked about consent. Again, please look over here. I have made you write in your marrow notes also that only females consent is required. Partners consent is not required. If female is less than 18 years or if she is mentally ill, then guardians consent is required. Same thing over here. I have written in one touch. Females consent is needed if she is a minor or if she is mentally retarded, then guardians consent is required. Now, please remember that for performing MTP, marriage proof is not required. Age proof is not required. That is not mandatory. See, understand, there is a difference between mandatory and contraindicated. So if you know, suppose there is a lady coming to you, you know that her age would be more than 18 years, right? So you, you don't need to see her uh, Aadhaar card, right? You don't need to see her age proof. But... If you have any confusion that whether she is 18 or not, then definitely you can ask for age proof. But age proof is not mandatory. On the other hand, it's not contraindicated also, right? Then, suppose a female is saying that uh, she, her pregnancy is a result of rape. Then I am not going to ask her to present an FIR report to me, right? The, uh, without any FIR report, I can go ahead with the MTP, right? Next important thing is all records of MTP, they have to be maintained for at least five years and every month, every month a report of how many MTPs were performed at your center has to be sent to the chief medical officer, right? So over here, mentally challenged girl presents for MTP, you are going to take consent from the guardian, right? Next. Next question was again on MTP and that was according to MTP Act 2021, which of the following is punishable? So MTP until 24 weeks? No, absolutely not. MTP up till 24 weeks is permissible in India except if it is for contraceptive failure. 
Pregnancy can be terminated at government approved hospitals only? Definitely. So, I mean, these are the right statements. So, I am that is not the answer. So, pregnancy, yes, it has to be terminated at government approved hospitals. MTP can be done by a registered medical practitioner. See, the condition is it sh uh, he or she should have been a registered medical practitioner, right? So, they should have been a registered medical practitioner with six months of house job experience. So, with six months of house job experience in OBS and Gaini or one year experience in any hospital, right? Or he or she should have performed, a registered medical practitioner should have performed 25 MTPs in which 20 MTPs he or she should have assisted in and in 5 MTPs they should have been the primary surgeon. So yes, registered medical practitioners are allowed to do MTP but then they need some more qualification and that some more additional training or some more additional qualification is that they should have done a 6 months house job in OBS and Gaini. They should have worked at least for 1 year in any multi-speciality hospital or they should have assisted in 25 MTPs in which 25, 20 MTPs they should have assisted and 5 MTPs they should have been the primary surgeons. So I would say this is incomplete. Uh, sorry. This is incomplete. Let me read the next option. No need to send mental, monthly records to government authorities. That's absolutely wrong. So, option A is absolutely correct, option B is absolutely correct, option C is partially correct and option D is completely wrong and that is why I'm going to take option D as the answer that it is punishable. If you are not sending monthly reports to CMO, that's punishable. If you don't have the required qualification, and you are doing MTP, that's punishable. If you reveal the name of the patient or the identity of the patient, that is punishable offense, right? Okay, coming to next question. Please remember, MTP becomes very, very important topic for all of you. All those who are following Maro, please read uh, MTP from the main video. Do MTP from the main videos of uh, Maro. And if you are going through One Touch, then please do MTP from One Touch. Very, very important. If you are not either of them, then over here is a complete screenshot of the MTP which I have given in one touch. You can take it and next time you can go through it. Right? Now, coming to the next question. A pregnant female with asthma presents with hypertension drug which has to be used R. Now, this patient does not just have hypertension. She has hypertension and asthma. See, as far as hypertension is concerned, according to the new Williams, there is nothing like the drug of choice for hypertension now. Now we have first line drugs to treat hypertension, that is first line drugs to treat PIH and first line drugs to treat chronic hypertension in pregnancy, right? Now before I go into the details, first tell me what is the indication for treating, for giving antihypertensives? The indication for giving antihypertensive is if BP of your patient is more than equal to 160 by 110 or persistently the BP of your patient is coming more than equal to 150 by 100. That is the indication for giving antihypertensives, right? Now, the first line antihypertensives for PIH, in other words, for severe preeclampsia are IV labetalol, IV hydralazine and oral nifedipine. As far as FMG exams are concerned, you have to remember these three. You also have to remember that for IV hydralazine, the maximum dose which you can give is 30 mg. For IV labetalol, the maximum dose which you can give is 220 mg. And you have to give oral nifedipine. Now, please remember, labetalol, that is, is contraindicated in asthma patient because its side effect is asthma and you all know that from your pharmacology knowledge if you know don't know it i have also mentioned it in your marrow notes as well as in one touch right now the other thing which i want all of you to remember is 
this table which I have included in one touch. That drugs which are used in severe preeclampsia are IV labetalol, IV hydrolyzine, oral nifedipine, right? Even if you don't remember the drugs which can be used, it's okay. Remember, methyl dopa is not contraindicated in pregnancy, but it is not used for managing severe preeclampsia. Why? Because in severe preeclampsia, BP of the patient is very high. So I need to give a drug which acts fast. On the other hand, methyl dopa is a slow acting drug. So, in case of severe preeclampsia, methyl dopa is not used. But that doesn't mean that methyl dopa is contraindicated. On the other hand, if they ask you what are the antihypertensives which are used for managing chronic hypertension in pregnancy. Drugs which are used for managing chronic hypertension in pregnancy are oral drugs like oral labetalol, oral nifedipine and oral methyl dopa. Again, if you cannot remember the drugs which can be used, it's okay, Vita, right? Remember, hydrolyzine is a drug which is available in IV format. So you tell me, a female who has chronic hypertension, do you want to give her IV hydrolyzine daily? No, not at all. That is why in chronic hypertension, IV hydrolyzine is not used or rather hydrolyzine is not used. So remember three drugs which are used in severe preeclampsia, three drugs which are used in chronic hypertension, one drug which is not used in severe preeclampsia, one antihypertensive which is not used in chronic hypertension. But on the other hand, there is a list of drugs which are absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy. The drugs which are absolutely contraindicated as antihypertensives in pregnancy are ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blocker. The name of angiotensin receptor blocker is losartan and disoxide. One important point which I want all of you to note that diuretics... Diuretics are not contraindicated in pregnancy. So, as such, diuretics are not contraindicated in pregnancy. In pregnancy, don't say that diuretics are contraindicated. Because in pregnancy also, if there is heart failure, the drug which I'm going to give will be diuretics. But yes, diuretics are contraindicated in PIH patients. Right? So in pregnancy, they are not contraindicated. Heart failure hoga pregnancy may definitely I'm going to use diuretics. Right? But in PIH patients, yes, they are contraindicated. Clear to all of you? Yes. So in this question, can you give labetalol? No. Can you give oral, whether you give oral or IV, can you give any kind of labetalol in patient of asthma? No. Do you ever give ACE inhibitors for managing hypertension? No, ACE inhibitors are absolutely contraindicated. So what is your answer? Your answer is by exclusion, oral nifedipine, right? So some, so many times, Bita, you might not be able to come to an answer just by looking at the options. What you have to do is you have to exclude, keep on excluding the options and you'll come to the right answer, right? Okay. Coming to the next question, question number five, which is malaria in malaria falciparum contraindicated in pregnancy. Now, malaria in pregnancy, but I should admit that I don't teach this topic whether you are preparing for neat PG or whether you are preparing for FMG. Malaria in pregnancy is always dealt by the PSM faculty, so I have not even included it in my one touch. But I would like to take up this question here so that from next time, you are prepared with this topic, right? So coming to antimalarians in pregnancy, which antimalarials are safe in all trimesters? The antimalarials which are safe in all trimesters are chloroquine, quinine, artisonate and artemether. In artemether, we have an artemether sulfadoxin combination and artemether lumifentrin combination. Please remember, artemether sulfadoxin combination is not being used these days. What we use is artemether lumifentrin combination. 
Now, the anti-malarials which are contraindicated in all trimesters, the anti-malarials which are contraindicated in all trimesters are primaquin number one. Remember, primaquin is a drug, if you give to a female who has G6PD deficiency, it is going to lead to hemolysis. Similarly, we don't know, the fetus might be having a G6PD deficiency and if I give primaquin to the mother, it can also lead to hemolysis in the fetus. Number two drug which is antimalarial and is contraindicated is doxycycline. Number three, halofentrin and number four, artemisin. Please remember that these four drugs, primaquin, doxycycline, halofentrin and artemisin, they are contraindicated in all trimesters. Whereas there is an antimalarial drug which is mefloquine, which is contraindicated only in first trimester. I want all of you to write these points in whatever notes you have of OBGY because antimalarials in pregnancy from now on become an important topic. Right now, the question which was asked to you was uh, in malaria falciparum, which is contraindicated in pregnancy. So remember, artemether, artemether is not contraindicated, quinine is not contraindicated, chloroquine is not contraindicated, primaquin is contraindicated. According to some of the students, they say that in the recall, ma'am, they were telling me that in the exam, there was an option like doxycycline also. So primaquin was also in the option and doxycycline was also in the option. If you have both of them in the option, please remember that doxycycline is one drug which sometimes, if required, may be given. It's, it's a relative contraindication in pregnancy. It's not absolutely contraindicated. If I have a replacement, I would prefer a replacement. But if not, then I will go ahead with doxycycline, right? But as such, if you ask me, doxycycline is contraindicated. But if there is a choice between primaquin and doxycycline, always choose primaquin because that's absolutely contraindicated, right? Coming to the next question, Naha. Over here, I wanted to share this screenshot from Maro PSM notes where Dr. Mukmohit has taught you that whenever there is malaria in pregnancy, in first trimester, the drug of choice is quinine. Right, and in second and third trimester, drug of choice is artesunate, sulfadoxin, pyrimethamine combination, or you can go for artemether, uh, lumifentrin combination. Right, so that is for first trimester quinine, for second trimester, and for third trimester, it is artesunate, sulfadoxin, and pyrimethamine combination, or you can go for artemether, lumifentrin combination. Right, great. Coming to the next question. Next question is, Mac Roberts Penover failed in shoulder dystocia. What is the next step in management? Now, I don't know why you people have this confusion and you are confused between suprapubic pressure and between Woods Penover. If you remember, I taught you the mnemonic, the acronym HELPER. Now, whether you are a marrow student, then also I have taught you this acronym HELPER. A reader of One Touch, then also I have taught you this uh, Acronym helper. Where helper, I have specifically told you that you have to follow this very sequence for management of shoulder dystocia. In helper, X stands for call for help, E stands for episiotomy and L stands for legs maneuver. That legs maneuver is Mac Roberts maneuver. Now, I have told you that after L there is P. Right after L, there is P and that is apply suprapubic pressure. First, you are going to try Mac Roberts maneuver without applying suprapubic pressure. Then in the if that all if that fails to deliver the shoulder, then you are going to tell your assistant to apply suprapubic pressure, perform Mac Roberts maneuver while you will try to deliver the shoulder. And this is a question which I always discuss in class. I always tell you that if you get a question that what is the next step and the choice is between Mac Roberts suprapubic pressure and Woods corkscrew, this is the sequence. First, you have to mark the answer as uh, Mac Roberts. If Mac Roberts fails, then suprapubic pressure along with Mac Roberts and then Woods Corkscrew. So over here, the same question which I tell you in class has been asked here 
And that means if all of you have attended my classes properly or if you watch the marrow videos properly, you will definitely mark the answer as suprapubic pressure and that's the correct answer, beta. Wood's corkscrew is not the correct answer, right? Okay, you tell me. What is the most common nerve which is injured when you perform McRoberts maneuver? The most common nerve which is injured when you perform McRoberts maneuver is lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. Right? Please remember that this helper, H E L P E R R, in this very sequence, you have to manage shoulder dystocia. For every maneuver, you have to give maximum 30 seconds. If in 30 seconds, the shoulders are not delivered, you have to go to the next step. Now, I want all of you to take a screenshot and keep it with you so that you know this, that how is shoulder dystocia relieved with the help of this acronym. And if you remember just three, four days before your exam on my Instagram handle also, I had... Uh, collaborated with management of shoulder dystocia in the 5 a.m. session. I told you that diabetes is an important topic. Everything about diabetes I discussed with you and I told you that shoulder dystocia, you are going to do it all, uh, yourself. And then I made a post on shoulder dystocia acronym helper and I had put it on my Instagram also. Right. Okay. Coming to the next question. A pregnant female complains of fainting while lying down and feels better while sitting. Obviously, this is something which we've done so many times that this is a supine hypotension syndrome. When a female is lying supine, the gravid uterus is going to press on the inferior vena cava because of which the venous return will decrease, because of which cardiac output will decrease and that leads to hypotension. And this hypotension, that is why she feels lightheadedness, she feels dizziness on lying supine. And the only management of this condition is tell her to lie in left lateral position, shift her to left lateral position and every all her symptoms become normal. This is exactly the reason why we tell all pregnant females that from third trimester onwards, they should always be lying in left lateral position, right? And they should be avoiding supine position. So this is because of inferior vena cava compression. Now just one question which I want all of you to read over here. First sign of developing supine hypotension is maternal tachycardia. Remember this next time they might ask you this, right? Coming to the next question, a primary gravida came to emergency at 1 p.m. Okay. At 1 p.m. she is 5 centimeters dilated. At 4 p.m. she is 6 centimeters dilated. Now you tell me that in active phase, now according to the new WHO recommendations, according to new WHO recommendations on which the uh, labor care guide or the next generation partogram is based. We all know that active phase begins at 5 centimeters. Right? And according to ACOG, active phase begins at 6 centimeters. We are going to follow what new WHO recommendation is saying that active phase begins at 5 centimeters. Now, my patient, when she came to me, she was 5 centimeters. That means she was in active phase, right? Now, in active phase, you know that the minimum dilatation of the cervix should be one centimeter per hour. This patient is five centimeters dilated at 1 p.m. After three hours, three hours have passed and the dilatation is only one centimeter. So, whenever... Whenever dilatation of the cervix is less than 1 cm per hour, it is called as a protracted active phase or it is called as slow progress of labor. And whenever you are getting a slow progress of labor, you should always do a per abdominal and a per vaginal examination. If on per abdominal examination, you see that the contractions are less, it means that now you it is the time when you have to accelerate the process of labor. And how do you accelerate the process of labor? By doing, by 
doing artificial rupture of membranes and by starting oxytocin. Till here it is clear. So whenever you have slow progress of labor, do a bar abdominal examination. See whether the contractions are normal or whether they are inadequate. If they are inadequate, if they are hypotonic, then accelerate the process of labor by doing artificial rupture of membranes and starting oxytocin. But if contractions are normal and still the labor is progressing slowly, that means that there is another problem. Hai. And what problem could it be? It could be a CPD. It could be that the head of the baby is in occipital posterior position. And how am I going to know whether the head of the baby is in occipital posterior position or whether it is cephalopelvic disproportion by doing a per vaginal examination. If by doing a per vaginal examination, if I see it is occipital posterior position, it's okay. Occipital posterior, which means the occiput is facing towards sacral promontory. Understand, beta. Whichever part has to deliver, it has to lie directly behind the pubic symphysis. In this case, what is happening? The occiput is facing posteriorly. So the head of the baby has to rotate and it has to come anterior. And if it has to rotate and come anterior, it is going to take some time. And I will give that time. That is why if it is occipital posterior position, you don't have to do anything. Don't say that if it is occipital posterior position, I'm going to do a cesarean section. No, I'm just going to wait and watch because most of the times the head of the baby automatically will become occipital anterior and normal delivery is going to happen. But if there is a CPD, then you have to go for cesarean section. So that is how you manage a Slow, slow progress in active phase, which is also called as a protracted active phase. So over here, the options given to you were cesarean section. No, I'm not for a slowly progressing labor. I'm not going to do a cesarean section. Wait for complete dilatation. No, the labor is progressing slowly. I have to do something. What am I going to do? ARM plus oxytocin and check her vagina, I mean, check her dilatation after two hours or ARM and oxytocin and check her dilatation after four hours. You tell me common sense. A patient is in labor. You have ruptured her membranes. You have given her oxytocin. Are you going to wait for four hours to do a per vaginal examination? No. I am going to check her per vaginal examination after two hours to see whether the labor is progressing normally or not. Right? Okay. See, over here, because there are two things. One is that WHO normally says that you should be doing a per vaginal examination after every four hours. Right? So, I know some of you might, after this discussion, ask me that, ma'am, why is not the answer ARM plus oxytocin and check after four hours? I am not saying check after four hours. This is because... Whenever you give oxytocin and whenever you do a rupture membrane, after that, please check her dilatation after two hours. Don't wait for four hours. Normally, when the labor is progressing normally, if the labor would have been progressing normally, I would have said that in uh, WHO says that do a per vaginal examination after every four hours. But in this patient, in this particular patient, what has happened? In this particular patient, I the labor was going slow. And I have given oxytocin. I have done artificial rupture of membranes. So now I'm going to check her per vaginal or I'm going to do her per vaginal examination after two hours. Have I made sense now? Great. Coming to the next question. Management of anemia in a pregnant lady with hemoglobin 10 grams in second trimester as per anemia Mukt Bharat program. Now, first tell me if hemoglobin is 10, in which category does it come? Does it come in mild to moderate category or does it come in severe anemia category? Remember, severe anemia is hemoglobin less than 7 grams. If hemoglobin is 10, that means it comes in mild to moderate category. Why I am telling you to 
understand whether hemoglobin is coming in mild to moderate or severe because management in second and third trimester depends upon whether hemoglobin is belonging to mild to moderate category or whether hemoglobin is belonging to severe anemia category. If hemoglobin belongs to mild to moderate anemia category, you have to check the gestational age of the patient. If gestational age is more than 34 weeks, then you have to give parenteral iron. If gestational age is less than 34 weeks, you have to give oral iron. How many tablets? Two tablets. See over here, properly I have written. You have to give two tablets, right? And this two tablets you are going to give. Then you are going to check her hemoglobin after one month. Ideally, what happens is, that the increase in hemoglobin after giving oral iron happens after three weeks, right? Jab bhi hum oral iron ki tablets dete hai, hemoglobin is going to increase after three weeks. So ideally, you should be checking hemoglobin after giving oral iron after three weeks. But generally, government of India guidelines say ki you can do it after one month. After one month, if you see that hemoglobin has increased. That means the patient is compliant to oral iron. But after one month, if you see that patient's hemoglobin has not increased, this means ki either your patient is not tolerating oral iron or this means that she was not taking oral iron. In other words, she was not compliant. In that case, we shift the patient to parenteral iron. So understand, mild to moderate anemia ka management Less than 34 weeks pay, it is oral iron, two tablets per day, which you have to give daily. You are going to check her hemoglobin after one month. After one month, if hemoglobin increases, continue the oral iron, right? Until when are you going to continue oral iron? You are going to continue oral iron till her hemoglobin becomes 11 grams per dl. Right? And once her hemoglobin becomes 11 grams per dl, then you will shift her to one tablet per day. And this one tablet per day, you will continue throughout pregnancy. You are going to continue throughout pregnancy. Plus, you are going to continue it for 180 days after delivery. Right? Now, if gestational age is more than 34 weeks, then you have to go for parenteral iron. When it comes to management of severe anemia, you further divide your patients into two categories. Hemoglobin less than 5, hemoglobin between 5 to 7. If hemoglobin is less than 5, no other option, only blood transfusion. Right? If hemoglobin is between 5 to 7, then you have to see the gestational age. Gestational age more than 34 weeks, blood transfusion. Gestational age less than 34 weeks, parenteral iron. This is the management of anemia in second and third trimester. In one touch as well as in marrow, I have also taught you management in first trimester. How do you manage anemia in first trimester? In first trimester, if hemoglobin is less than 5 or if there are signs of heart failure, you have to give blood transfusion. If hemoglobin is more than 5 and there are no signs of heart failure, then you have to give oral iron. Please remember, in first trimester, parenteral iron is contraindicated. Right? Now, when it comes to composition of these IFA pills, composition of IFA pills is iron tablets 60 milligrams, folic acid 500 micrograms and these tablets are red in color. So, over here, the it was 10, hemoglobin is 10 and you have to tell in second trimester. So, now I, that means hemoglobin 10 means mild to moderate and second trimester means less than 34 weeks. That means I have to give oral iron. How much oral iron? Two tablets of oral iron. So, I am going to give 60 milligrams plus 500 micrograms of folic acid twice a day. Right? That's the correct answer.
Next question. A female presents to gyneopathy on fifth day of unprotected intercourse. What emergency contraception is advised to her? Now, first of all, please understand that all emergency contraceptives, they act best when they are given within 72 hours of unprotected intercourse. But maximum they can be given up till 5 days. And whenever a female is coming to me on 5th day of unprotected intercourse, at that time the best contraceptive is copper IUCD. So over here I have written copper IUCD. It is inserted within 5 days of unprotected intercourse. As well as levonorgestrel is concerned or OCPs are concerned or any other uh, emergency contraceptive is concerned, all of them they have to be given within 72 hours. Ulipristal can also be given on day 5. But if I have to choose between copper IUCD and Ulipristal, then the best answer is copper IUCD. Right? So two contraceptives can be given on day 5. You can give copper IUCD. You can also give Ulipristal. But the best one is copper IUCD. Please remember overall the most effective contraceptive, most effective emergency contraceptive is copper IUCD. Copper IUCD can be given up to 5 days. If they ask you most effective hormonal emergency contraceptive, then it is Ulipristal. The one which is most commonly used is Levonorgestrel. Right now, please remember, Centchromane and Mifepristone are also emergency contraceptives. Three drugs which are not emergency contraceptives are progesteron only pill. Just because levonorgestrel is an emergency contraceptive, that does not mean progesteron only pill is an emergency contraceptive. The progesteron only pill which is available in India has desogestrel and it is not an emergency contraceptive. Number two, copper IUCD is an emergency contraceptive. Mirena is not an emergency contraceptive and please remember Mesoprost is not an emergency contraceptive. The main mechanism of action by which emergency contraceptives they act is by delaying ovulation and by inhibiting implantation. They do not bring about an ovulation. They delay the ovulation, right? So over here, mesoprost is not an emergency contraceptive. Levonorgestrel can be used only up till 72 hours. Copper IUCD is the best answer followed by Ulipristal, right? Next, a condition where both male and female partner treated together for genital infections. So what is that condition? And the options which were given to you were candidiasis, herpes, syphilis and trichomonas. Now, even if you don't know anything about the other options, if you remember this table which is there not only in one touch, it is also there in marrow nodes. That partner treatment is given in trichomonas vaginitis, right? In case of candidiasis, partner treatment is not given unless partner shows treatment. In case of bacterial vaginosis, partner treatment is not needed. Trichomonas is a sexually transmitted disease and in trichomonas, partner treatment has to be given, right? So over here, the correct answer is trichomonas. Oh, sorry, this is the same next another question. So over here, the correct answer is trichomonas, right? Then, curdy white discharge with pseudo hyphae. Please remember, vaginitis is very, very important. In case of trichomonas vaginitis, the kind of discharge which you get, you are going to describe it as a frothy yellowish discharge, which has a foul smell. Please remember in trichomonas, you get strawberry vagina and the pH of the discharge is more than equal to 4.5, right? Now, for all kinds of vaginitis, the investigation of choice is saline microscopy and gold standard is culture. In case of trichomonas, motility will be seen. Now, when it comes to bacterial vaginosis, you get a grayish white discharge, which is foul smelling. Please remember in bacterial vaginosis, 
that there is no itching. The pH of the discharge is more than 4.5 and in case of a bacterial vaginosis, when you are going to do saline microscopy, you are going to see clue cells. Very, very important, right? Then please remember the criteria for diagnosing bacterial vaginosis is AMSELS criteria. Now, coming to candidiasis, you get a curdy white discharge or a cotton cheese-like discharge. The main complaint is pruritus and other complaint over here is splash dysuria, right? And when you are going to do a saline microscopy, hyphae will be seen. Please remember, clue cells are seen in bacterial vaginosis. Clear to all of you? So, these are all the questions which they have asked you in vaginitis, curdy white discharge, Candidiasis, Amsel's criteria, bacterial vaginosis. Now, in Amsel's criteria, there are four criteria and out of the four criteria, first of all, what are the criteria? The pH of the discharge should be more than or equal to 4.5. It should be a dirty white discharge. Right? Then when you add 10% potassium hydroxide to the discharge, you get a fishy odor or a mean like odor. Right? And number four, clue cells are present. Or when you are going to do saline microscopy, clue cells will be present. Clue cells are more than 20%. So more than equal to 20% clue cells would be present. What are clue cells? Clue cells are epithelial cells. They are normal epithelial cells to which the bacteria are adhered, right? So look over here. This is a normal cell. So over here, this is a normal cell and see this cell over here. This is a clue cell. This is a cell to which lots of bacteria are adhered. So whenever you get clue cells more than or equal to 20%, that, that is one of the criteria for AM cells. Now, out of these four criteria, any three should be present. That is what AM cells says for diagnosing bacterial vaginosis. Right? Then everything about uh, vaginitis becomes important. Please, Bacho, for next time, I want all of you to remember syndromic management. I want you to remember the kit for vaginal discharge, for cervical discharge and for PID. Right? Question number 14. Most common site for genital tuberculosis. I'm sure all of you know that, that the most common site for uh, genital tuberculosis is fallopian tube. In fallopian tube, the most common site is ampulla. Right? Now, important points which are related to uh, genital TB. Please remember, genital TB is a secondary infection. Most common site is lungs followed by lymph node from lungs and lymph node infection is going to come into the genital tract by hematogenous route. Most common site is fallopian tube. In fallopian tube, it's the ampulla. From fallopian tube, the infection is going to go to the endometrium and to the ovary by direct spread. Least common site is vagina and vulva. Most common symptom of uh, genital TB is infertility. Most common menstrual irregularity which is seen in genital TB patients is polymenorrhea followed by secondary amenorrhea. Most common pelvic finding in a genital TB patient is absolutely normal pelvis. You don't get anything, right? That's the most common finding. Second most common finding is adenexal tenderness. Now, if genital TB is happening in adolescent females, then the most common finding which you get is a bilateral adenexal mass. Normally, if you do uh, get a genital TB in a reproductive age female, you are going to get absolutely normal pelvis. Investigation of choice for genital TB is endometrial biopsy, which should be done in the premenstrual phase. Treatment for genital TB, ADT for 6 months and specifically for infertility, you will have to go for IVF. Please remember, genital TB is a PID which is spread by hematogenous root, right? It is not sexually transmitted and that is why genital TB is the most common PID which is seen in a virgin female, right? Now, a woman who has undergone, who was, who has done strenuous exercise complains of involuntary urine voiding during the workout. Diagnosis is so anytime, anytime if there is involuntary escape of urine, 
whenever the intra-abdominal pressure is increased, which could be due to sneezing, coughing or laughing, that is what is stress urinary incontinence. Please remember, stress urinary incontinence most of the times is because the bladder neck descends down. Now, you tell me if a problem is happening because the bladder has descended down, bladder has shifted down, what would you like to do? Lift karado? Right? You would like to lift the bladder up. And that is what you have to do in surgeries for SUI. In SUI, I just want all of you to remember the definition of SUI and I want you to remember the names of the surgeries for SUI. So the names of the surgeries are, the most commonly performed surgeries are TOT and TVT. Where TOT stands for Trans Tension Free Trans Obturator Tape. TVT stands for Tension Free Trans Vaginal Tape. Are you understanding? So if they ask you what is the most commonly done surgery for SUI, TOT followed by TVT. TOT Trans Obturator Tape. So Tension Free Trans Obturator Tape. TVT Tension Free Trans Vaginal Tape. But this is not the best surgery. Best surgery is, as I told you, you have to just lift something up. You have to lift the bladder up and this is what is called as Bursch Colpo Suspension. Don't remember anything else, just these names of these three surgeries and the definition for SUI. Most commonly TOT followed by TVT. Best Bursch Colpo Suspension. Clear to all of you? Please remember in patients of prolapse, patients of prolapse may complain of stress urinary incontinence. That's all what you have to remember on stress urinary incontinence. Don't take stress about this topic at all. Iske alawa, nothing is going to come. Then comes match the sequence. Now you are going to tell me, first of all, what happens? First of all, the breast is prepared during pregnancy or first of all, lactogenesis happens. First tell me that. Is the milk secretion going to, milk, uh, milk synthesis going to happen first or first of all, breast will be prepared during pregnancy? Obviously, first of all, breast is going to be prepared during pregnancy. Then what is going to be happen? Then what will happen? Then there will be synthesis of milk, which is lactogenesis. Then what is going to happen? Then there is going to be milk ejection, which is galactokinesis. Please remember for mammogenesis, the hormones which are responsible are estrogen and progesterone, right? For lactogenesis, the hormone which is responsible is prolactin. Then galactokinesis means milk ejection. For milk ejection, the hormone which is responsible is oxytocin. And then there is galactopoiesis. What is galactopoiesis? Continuous milk production. For continuous milk production, which hormone is required? Prolactin and suckling of the breast by the neonate. So always remember, Breast milk and everything related to milk synthesis, milk production, contraindications of breastfeeding, how long should the breast milk be kept, right, at room temperature, in fridge, in freezer, all this becomes very, very important for all of you, right? So the sequence is mammogenesis, lactogenesis, galactokinesis and then galactopoiesis. Galactopoiesis is maintenance or continuous milk production, maintenance of milk production. Right? Clear to all of you? Then, which part forms the maternal side of the placenta? I'm sure all of you have done this correctly that all of you know that it is the decidua basalis which forms the maternal side of the placenta, whereas the fetal side of the placenta is formed from chorion frondosum. They could have given chorion frondosum, they could have given cytotrophoblast, they could have given a chorionic plate, anything they could have written. So it is the, uh, the maternal side of the placenta is formed by decidua basalis. Fetal side of the placenta is formed by chorion frontosum. Now always it is the fetal side which is larger, which forms four-fifth of the placenta. Maternal side always forms one-fifth of the placenta. Tell me a condition where the fetal side of the placenta is small, maternal side is big and it surrounds the fetal side in the form of a ring. Whenever fetal side of the placenta is small and maternal side is big and it is surrounding the fetal side in the form of a ring, then that is called as 
extra corial placenta in extra corial placenta you have to remember circumvallate placenta what do you mean by circumvallate see circumvallate means this suppose is the fetal side of the placenta as i told you extra corial means that the fetal side is small maternal side is big so orange color is the maternal side and this orange color maternal side is surrounding the fetal side of the placenta in the form of a ring now when maternal side is surrounding the fetal side in the form of a ring in between them a valve like thickening is present valve like thickening if this valve like thickening is present it is called as circumvallate placenta right clear to all of you okay Next question. A 16-year-old girl comes to gynecology with complaints of delayed puberty, primary amenorrhea and short stature. Every time I have told you that whenever you get a question with primary amenorrhea and short stature, it has to be Turner's syndrome. Nothing else Turner's syndrome. right primary amenorrhea with short stature is turner syndrome and nothing else now in turner syndrome what is going to happen in turner syndrome there will be short stature there will be low hairline shield shaped chest widely spaced nipples there will be short metacarpal brown spots then there is going to be coarctation of iota cubitus valgus the ovaries are not properly developed that is there are streak ovaries because the ovaries are not properly developed why are the ovaries not properly developed because the chromosome number is 45 xo in order to for so that the ovaries develop properly what is required both x chromosomes are required ovary hongi ki nahi hongi whether ovary will be present or absent that is dependent on y chromosome if y chromosome is absent then we know that the gonads become ovary but for proper development of ovaries but your both x chromosomes are required and in turner syndrome there is only one x o chromosome and that is why although the gonads are ovaries they are not properly developed and because they are not properly developed estrogen levels are less and because estrogen levels are less that is why breast development is not proper right and that is why you are getting widely spaced nipples poor breast development right streak ovaries and primary amenorrhea because the ovaries are not properly developed right now in gynae always i tell you just one thing and that is whatever is the problem you have to treat that in gynae in turner syndrome i came to know that you got a question on the management of turner syndrome also options you people don't remember i am telling you the management here now because in turner syndrome the problem is that the, there is short stature and the problem is that ovaries are not properly developed because of which there is decreased estrogen now what would you like to do you would like to give growth hormone to the patient and you would like to give estrogen to the patient why are you going to give estrogen so that breast development occurs now because in turner syndrome patient they are females and uterus is present if you give them only estrogen this is going to result in endometrial cancer you can in estrogen all of you know leads to endometrial proliferation and that can lead to endometrial cancer that is why what am i going to do i am going to give estrogen for one year so that the breast develops and then i am going to give estrogen plus progesterone life long so now write in your notebooks what management are you going to give for turner syndrome number 1 you are going to give growth hormone number 2 you are going to give estrogen alone for one year so that breast development happens and number 3 after one year you are going to give estrogen plus progesterone throughout uh, i mean then continue continuously give her estrogen plus progesterone right clear to all of you 
So this is how you manage Turner's syndrome. Coming to the question which came to you, where I know the options, they were all of the following can be seen in a female with Turner's syndrome except webbed neck can be seen, yes. Widely spaced nipples can be seen, yes. Coarctation of iota can be seen, yes. Mental retardation, no, they are not mentally retarded. Turner's syndrome patients are not mentally retarded, right? Coming to the next question, in a 22-year-old primary gravida on ultrasound, in a 22 weeks old primary gravida on ultrasound, you are getting a marginal placenta. What is the next step in management? Now, again, please be very careful that the diagnosis of placenta previa is made in third trimester. You cannot make a diagnosis of placenta previa in second trimester. So even if the ultrasound is showing you that the placenta is low lying, then also in third trimester, you have to confirm it and exactly the same case was written over here in your one touch. I had made you write that suppose a diagnosis of placenta previa is made on ultrasound at 20 weeks. Here they have given 22 weeks. Then in that case, remember in 90% cases when ultrasound will be repeated in third trimester, placenta will be in upper segment. That is in 90% cases this happens. That when you are going to uh, repeat the ultrasound in third trimester, placenta which was initially lying low. Now you will see that in third trimester it is lying in the upper segment. Right? And that is why you have to repeat ultrasound first at 32 weeks and then repeat at 36 weeks. And if at 36 weeks also you see that the placenta is lying low, then you go for elective cesarean section between 36 to 37 weeks. Are you understanding? So in this case, when I'm seeing that the placenta is lying low at 22 weeks, I'm going to repeat her ultrasound at 32 weeks first. If at 32 weeks it is still lying low, I will repeat it at 36 weeks. And if at 36 weeks it is still lying low, then I'm going to go for a cesarean section right now please understand that at 20 weeks i cannot make a diagnosis of placenta previa i cannot tell my patient that you have placenta previa but actually the placenta is lying low placenta <coughs> because placenta is lying low i know that in third trimester most of the times this placenta would have gone up but abhi the placenta is lying low now, because just now the placenta is lying low, there are certain advices which I have to give her. One advice which I have to give her is to avoid lifting heavy weight. Second advice which I have to give her is avoid any strenuous physical exercise. Third uh, advice which I have to give her is do not stand for more than four hours. Right? So don't exert yourself basically. Number four, I have to tell her to avoid intercourse. And then I also, I have to tell her that if you have bleeding at any point of time, come to me immediately. So these are the advices which you have to give to your patient, right? Then comes your next question, which is gold standard for endometriosis. And I'm sure all of you know that. I don't even have to show you the... Um, Screenshot of what is the gold standard for endometriosis. The gold standard for endometriosis is histopathological examination. So now over here, if a histopathological examination was given, you will mark the answer as histopathological examination. If histopathological examination is not given, then you are going to choose the answer as laparoscopy, which is actually the investigation of choice. Another question which came on investigations this time was a question where they asked that there is ovarian torsion. In ovarian torsion, what is the management of choice? Please understand that whenever there is ovarian torsion, the problem is a vascular problem, right? And whenever there is a vascular problem, you have to go for Doppler ultrasound. So over here also the answer is Doppler ultrasound. Now, for your upcoming exams, I'm going to make you write a list of investigations which are investigation of choices and gold standard in various conditions. So whenever you get a question on atypical uterine bleeding and they ask you what is the investigation. So in atypical uterine bleeding, you have to do urine pregnancy test. And after that, the investigation, the proper investigation which you have to do is TBS, that is ultrasound. So in all patients of AUB, you have to do an ultrasound and you have to rule out pregnancy. 
Now, if AUB is happening in a female who's more than equal to 40 years, along with ultrasound, you will do endometrial biopsy in all cases, right? Now, if your question says that there is a female who's having PMB, PMB stands for postmenopausal bleeding. In that case, they ask you, what is the investigation of choice? Again, it is ultrasound. But now you are going to do endometrial biopsy only. You are going to do endometrial biopsy only if endometrial thickness is more than equal to 4 millimeters, right? So remember, AUB in a female more than equal to 40 years, you have to do ultrasound and endometrial biopsy. Postmenopausal bleeding may you have to do endometrial biopsy only if endometrial thickness is more than equal to 4 millimeters, right? In fibroid, what is the investigation of choice? Again, it is ultrasound. In polyps, what is the uh, first investigation? Uh, in polyps, the first investigation is ultrasound. The investigation of choice is hysteroscopy, right? So fibroids may investigation of choice is ultrasound. In polyps, the first investigation which you do is ultrasound, but the investigation of choice is hysteroscopy because it is both diagnostic plus therapeutic, right? In adenomyosis, the first investigation is ultrasound. The investigation of choice is MRI and the gold standard is histopathological examination. In endometriosis, the first investigation is ultrasound. On ultrasound, you will be able to see a chocolate cyst. Investigation of choice is laparoscopy and gold standard is histopathological examination. For an ovarian cyst, the investigation of choice is TBS and if there is a torsion in ovarian cyst, it is Doppler ultrasound. One important point which I want all of you to remember for your future exams is that in case of polyp, right, when you are going to switch the Doppler, you are going to get feeder vessel sign, right? And in adenomyosis on ultrasound, the Finding is myometrial cyst and Venetian blind appearance. Venetian blind appearance, right? Now, in cancers, if they ask you what is the investigation of choice to know how much myometrium is involved or how much parametrium is involved, the investigation of choice is MRI. For lymph node involvement, PET CT. In urinary fistulas or in vesicovaginal fistulas, the investigation of choice is methylene blue three swab test. I have changed the answer from cystoscopy to methylene blue three swab test because that is the general consensus, right? Now for tubal blockage, the investigation of choice is HSG. So if you want to know whether the tubes are patent or blocked, the investigation of choice is HSG. Gold standard investigation is laparoscopic chromoperturbation. Laparoscopic chromoperturbation. So please make a list of these investigations and keep it with you so that next time, any time in any exam, if you get investigation of choices or gold standard or first investigation, you have the entire list in front of you, right? And you don't make a mistake in a question, which is so very easy. Now, my next question is a multigravita with previous cesarean section history in which of the following can vaginal delivery be tried? Now, please remember that how are the cesarean sections? What types of cesarean sections do you have? If you do a cesarean section, where on the uterus? Whenever you do a cesarean section, important is not the skin incision. Incision on the uterus is very important. If you have given a vertical incision on the upper part of the uterus, that is called as a classical cesarean section, right? Or that is called as Sanger's incision. 
right? And whenever you've done a classical cesarean section, then every time you have to do a cesarean section, any time a patient conceives, because there are high chances of rupture if you do a vaginal delivery. On the other hand, if you have done given a transverse incision in the lower part of the uterus, a transverse incision in the lower segment of the uterus, that is what is called as LSCS. Now, whenever you do LSCS, then you can go for vaginal delivery because the chances of rupture are less. A vagina, uh, LSCS may, there are two guidelines. One guideline is ACOG guideline. ACOG says that no matter how many number of times LSCS has been done, you can try vaginal delivery, right? Then we have national guidelines. Our national guidelines say that if you have done LSCS twice or more than twice, then next time you have to do a cesarean section, VBAC is contraindicated. So I'm repeating, ACOG says irrespective of the number of times you have done LSCS, you can try VBAC. Our national guidelines say that if you have done, suppose LSCS once because of fetal distress, second time you did LSCS because your patient had placenta previa. Now third time, if everything is normal also, still I will not try vaginal delivery, I will have to do a cesarean section. But ACOG says no, if this is the case, third time, if everything is normal, you can try vaginal delivery. You are going to follow our national guidelines, right? So, please remember what are the contraindications for VBAC or 2 lakh? Contraindications, achha. so what is 2 lakh? VBAC stands for vaginal birth after cesarean. Right? And 2 lakh stands for same thing. It's a new name. Trial of labor after cesarean. Right? It's one and the same thing. Now, contraindications for VBAC or 2 lakh are prior classical cesarean section, prior T-shaped incision, prior history of uterine rupture or if there is history of myomectomy or hysterotomy. So if any surgery was done on the uterus, right, whether it was a myomectomy done, whether it was a hysterotomy done, all these are contraindications for VBAC. What do you understand by a T-shaped incision? So suppose you had a patient in whom first time you did a classical cesarean section. Now, every time, you know, any time you've done a classical cesarean section and if a female conceives, you have to do a cesarean section next time. Next time when a patient of classical cesarean section comes and you do a LSCS. So, kaisa incision man gaya? T-shaped incision man gaya. And if a female has a T-shaped incision, which means actually incision to upper part may be hai na? So, whenever there is an incision on the upper part of the uterus, you cannot try vaginal delivery. So, whether it is a classical cesarean section, whether it is a T-shaped incision, whether it, there is previous history of rupture, whether there is previous history of myomectomy or hysterotomy, all these are contraindications for VBAC. Another very important contraindication for VBAC is if there is CPD in present pregnancy. Relative contraindications for VBAC are macrosomia, malpresentation. So, if there is breach in present pregnancy or post-term pregnancy, right? So, over here, they are asking in which of the following can vaginal delivery be tried? Previous transverse cesarean section. Transverse cesarean section means LSCS. So, I can try vaginal delivery. Breach in present pregnancy? No. Previous vertical cesarean section. Previous vertical cesarean section means classical cesarean section. No. Preeclampsia, I'm not plus minus. Right? So the answer over here which you had to mark was previous transverse cesarean section. That is LSCS. Right? Next question. Uterine inversion management is. First of all, tell me what is uterine inversion? Uterine inversion is, suppose over here this is the uterus and this was the placenta which was attached to it. Now, 
I have to give traction to the cord right during third stage of labor right so that the placenta comes out but I have to give traction to the cord only once the placenta is separated. Imagine placenta is still attached to the uterus and aapne pakad ke cord ko pull kar diya. What is going to happen? This uterus is going to invert. That is what is uterine inversion. And whenever there is uterine inversion, management is that you have to put the uterus back into its normal position, right? So this over here is uterine inversion. Everything what you need to know on uterine inversion. Management of uterine inversion because uterine inversion may patient will go into postpartum collapse. Patient will go into shock. Immediate shock. Why will patient go into immediate shock? Because you have pulled the cord. Because of which your patient goes into neurogenic shock. So whenever your patient goes into immediate shock after delivery, you should always suspect uterine inversion and immediate shock is neurogenic. Once the uterus inverts, ek bar jab inversion ho gaya, then the tone of the uterus will be lost and then patient will have hemorrhagic shock. Initially she goes into neurogenic shock, later on she goes into hemorrhagic shock and death of a patient happens due to hemorrhagic shock. The moment you diagnose uterine inversion, uterine inversion is an obstetrical emergency and you should be calling for help. You have to resuscitate your patient. That's the first thing. The next thing which you have to do is you have to reposit the uterus back into its normal position. So manual replacement of the uterus has to be done. Manual replacement of the uterus is called as Johnson's technique, right? Now, if you are unable to replace the uterus manually, then give uterine relaxants and again try to reposit the uterus manually. And in spite of giving uterine relaxant, if you are unable to reposit the uterus manually, then go to uterine inversion surgeries. Just the names of the surgeries which you have to remember, Huntington surgery and Haltane surgery, right? So what did I do? The moment I see there is uterine inversion, I will try to replace the uterus in its normal position with my hands. Please remember if the placenta is attached to the uterus, do not try to remove the placenta. If you try to remove the placenta just now, there will be a lot of bleeding. With the placenta attached, reposit the uterus in its normal position. If it fails, give uterine relaxant and then again try. And if it fails, go for uterine surgeries, Huntington surgery or Haltane surgery. Once the uterus in its, is in its normal position, now stop giving the tocolytic or the uterine relaxant. Now give, remove the placenta and give oxytocin, right? The outdated method for treating uterine inversion is O'Sullivan's hydrostatic method. Based on this, let us see our options. Uterine inversion management is manual replacement of uterus, hydrostatic method, oxytocin or Huntington method. It is manual replacement of the uterus. Next question, how much glucose is given for screening of diabetes in pregnancy in India? And I'm sure all of you know that in India, we are following the DIPSI guideline. And as per DIPSI guideline, in the first antenatal visit and then between 24 to 28 weeks, we have to screen all pregnant females for diabetes by giving them 75 grams of glucose mixed in 300 ml of water irrespective of previous meals. So over here, this is how the diagnosis of gestational diabetes is made. I have taught you this in the 5 a.m. challenge videos also. We back also, I took in the 5 a.m. challenge videos. Right? Rather, I took uterine inversion also in 5 a.m. challenge videos. So over here, the answer is 75 grams. Next question, anti-D dose in RH negative female at 11 weeks of pregnancy. Now, please remember, please remember that 
whenever you are giving anti d in first trimester and why do you give anti d in first trimester whenever you have an rh negative female rh negative female pregnant female right with indirect comb test negative very very important so the indication for giving anti d is rh negative female with indirect comb test negative you have to give anti d now this anti d in all rh negative pregnant females has to be given at 28 weeks of pregnancy right this is called as anti partum prophylaxis so in all pregnant females you are going to do indirect comb test when are you going to do indirect comb test you are going to do indirect comb test at the first antenatal visit at the first antenatal visit and then you are going to repeat at 28 weeks if at 28 weeks indirect comb test is negative to all pregnant females who are rh negative you are going to give anti d right number 2 you are going to give anti d to all pregnant females after after delivery and you are going to give them after delivery if baby is rh positive and direct comb test is negative right so one you are going to give anti d to all rh negative females in the antepartum period at 28 weeks which is called as antepartum prophylaxis then you give anti d to all preg all females rh negative females after delivery right all rh negative females all rh negative females after delivery right only if their baby is rh positive and direct comb test is negative these are the two times when you have to give anti d other than this if you are doing any procedure in first trimester or any procedure in second or third trimester in an rh negative female any procedure then also you have to give anti d for example if there is an rh negative female and she has had abortion so you've done an mtp or she has had an abortion if she has ectopic pregnancy and you've managed that if she has molar pregnancy and you have managed that if you have done chorionic villi sampling right then you give anti d similarly in second and third trimester suppose if patient has had any antepartum hemorrhage if you've done amniocentesis if you've done any version if you've done manual removal of placenta if there has been fetal death then also you give anti d so when do you give anti d you give anti d to all pregnant females at 28 weeks antepartum prophylaxis you give anti d to all rh negative to all rh negative pregnant females then you give to all rh negative pregnant females after delivery right that is called as postpartum prophylaxis conditions apply what are the conditions apply antepartum prophylaxis may you are going to give anti d if indirect comb test is negative at 28 weeks postpartum prophylaxis may you are going to give anti d if direct comb test is negative and baby is rh positive other than this in first trimester when you do any procedure you have to give anti d when you do any procedure in second or third trimester you have to give anti d till here have you understood what are the indications for giving anti d now then comes the dose of anti d very simple whenever you are giving anti d in first trimester dose is 50 micrograms other than this whenever you give anti d for at any other time any time after first trimester dose is 300 micrograms 300 micrograms is 1500 international units right clear to all of you okay then the point of reference in pop q classification okay this was something which was not expected to be asked in fmge pop q classification is pelvic organ prolapse classification and in one touch i have told you that whenever the new classification which is used for prolapse is pop q classification and in pop q classification the reference point is hymen hymen is the reference point right now about pop q i just want all of you to draw this diagram and remember so the reference point is the hymen if you see that the prolapse area 
the prolapsed uterus is lying within one centimeter of the hymen. So if the prolapsed uterus is one centimeter above the hymen or one centimeter below the hymen, then you call it as stage two prolapse. Right? If the prolapsed part is more than one centimeter above the hymen. It is more than one centimeter above the hymen. That is stage or grade one prolapse. Right? If it is more than one centimeter below the hymen, more than one centimeters below the hymen. Then it is stage or grade three. You don't say it's stage, grade three prolapse. Right? So grade one, grade two, grade three. What do you understand by grade one, grade two, grade three? Grade, remember grade two. Grade two means one centimeter on either side of the hymen. 1 centimeter above or 1 centimeter below the hymen. Then if it is more than 1 centimeter above the hymen, grade 1. If it is more than 1 centimeter below the hymen, grade 3. Then comes prosidentia. Prosidentia means if entire uterus lies outside the hymen. If the entire uterus lies outside the hymen, then that is grade Four prolapse, which is not called as grade four, which is called as prosidentia, right? So grade one, grade two, grade three and prosidentia. What is the reference point? The reference point is the hymen, right? Okay. Next question. Ideal time to do ultrasound to measure nuchal translucency for aneuploidy. Now, this is something which I've always been teaching you that in aneuploidy screening, first trimester screening may on ultrasound, you have to see nuchal translucency. Nuchal translucency normally is less than 3 millimeters. If it is more than equal to 3 millimeters, it is abnormal. The ideal time to check nuchal translucency is between 11 to 13 weeks, right? And how does nuchal translucency appear? This is the fluid filled area which is present below the neck. If nuchal translucency is more than equal to 3 millimeters, what does that indicate? That indicates aneuploidy in which most commonly it indicates Down syndrome. For, or it could be trisomy 18, trisomy 13 or Turner's syndrome. Other than aneuploidy, if you are getting nuchal translucency more than 3 millimeters, it indicates congenital heart disease, right? Now, I have also told you there are various names for ultrasound done in different times during pregnancy. So if you do ultrasound between 6 to 8 weeks, that's a dating scan or a viability scan. Nuchal translucency is done between 11 weeks to 13 weeks. Anomaly scan, target scan or a booking scan is the level 2 scan. This is also called as level 2 scan, which is done between 18 to 20 weeks. And then we have a growth scan, which is done between 32 to 34 weeks. Growth scan can also detect placenta previa. If entire pregnancy may only one ultrasound has to be done, then it has to be a target scan. Target scan has to be done in all pregnant females, right? Another very important point is about fetal echo. Please remember, fetal echo is not mandatory. Fetal echo is not mandatory. If you are suspecting that the baby is having heart disease, then only you have to go for fetal echo. And if fetal echo is required, then it has to be done between 22 to 24 weeks. In every pregnant female, we don't get a fetal echo done. Right? Next question. Management of condyloma acuminata in pregnancy. Golden question which I have been telling in my classes that condyloma acuminata means genital warts and this is the only thing which I tell about genital warts that genital warts is caused by HPV 6 and HPV 11 and its treatment is TCA. 
ट्राइक्लोरोसिटिक एसिड ड्यूरिंग प्रेगनेंसी राइट नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन वाइफ ऑफ अ ट्रैप ड्राइवर बिलोंगिंग टू लो सोशियो इकोनॉमिक स्टेटस प्रेजेंट टू गाइनी ओपरी टू रूल आउट कैंसर सर्विक्स वॉट इज द रिकमेंडेड स्क्रीनिंग मेथड नाउ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट Now, what they are telling you is low socio-economic status. The moment your question says low socio-economic status, that means you have to follow WHO protocol. WHO's protocol is for the economically weaker section. It is for uh, the uh, you know resource limited countries. And according to WHO's screening for cancer cervix, the best method is HPV DNA. and if hpv dna is not given then via right that is what who says please remember who screening is different acog screening is different pap smear is recommended by acog acog says that you have to do pap smear for screening so acog recommends pap smear as a screening test and according to acog screening should begin at 21 years it should pap smear should be repeated after every 3 years till a female becomes 30 years of age and after 30 years you have to do pap plus hpv dna testing and this has to be continued for every 5 years till 65 years of age that is what is acog recommendation screening begins 21 years screening ends 65 years 21 years pay pap smear every 3 years you have to do till a patient till your female becomes 30 years After thirty years, HPV plus Pap smear, HPV plus Pap smear is called as co-test, which has to be done after every five years till she becomes sixty-five years of age. Whereas WHO says the age at which you have to start screening thirty years, age which you have to stop screening fifty years. WHO says best is that you go for HPV plus VIA. If HPV plus VIA you cannot do, best is HPV plus VIA. If you cannot do this, then go for HPV. If not, then VIA. That is the sequence which WHO says. According to WHO, screening begins at thirty years and ends at fifty years. Now, so in low socio economic status, ideally I should be going for WHO screening protocol. And if Pap smear and VIA both were given, the best answer is VIA. But but. If VIA was not given, then so there was no confusion. Then the answer is Pap smear. Clear to all of you? Yes. So that brings us to the end of the discussion, bacho. See, one thing which I would want all of you to know is whatever is done cannot be undone, but you can prevent it from happening again. And how can you prevent? It? First of all, I would want that all of you clear your exam. Definitely, I want all of you to clear your exam. God forbid if you don't clear your exam have you realized after this discussion that these days superficial questions are not asked please bachcho don't do this mistake don't fall into this trap that study superficially and you will get 200 plus marks you will never cross 150 marks you will get 145 146 149 130 if you are not studying properly you know every time you are falling into this trap that you are studying everything superficially and you are studying everything superficially that's a trap that is a trap which has been created by all offline institutes for you and i'm being very blunt about it please do not fall into this trap just in case you don't clear your exam please please study thoroughly this time clear your concepts and then i give your december paper but nevertheless all the best for your results and i will be waiting to hear from all of you whether you get good results definitely i will give you a pat on the back but if you are unable to get the result which you expected i will be there to support you take care love you all all the best